A funny thing people tend to do when forming in groups for survival is to create a social structure that dictates how that group works together and functions overall. But what's interesting about people is that our social structures are just as unique and different as they are the same. There can be hugely varying levels of equality between genders and age. There are often group and spiritual leaders, respectively. And the structures can take the forms of anything from a large extended family unit to a rigid caste system. And when writing fiction, it's really fun to play with these structures and see what kind of story you can tell through them. In my Religions Part 1 video, I talked a bit about the Sodilo Stone Snake, considered currently to be the oldest site of human worship. But what I didn't talk about was the larger Sodilo Hills, which are just as fascinating on their own. The Sodilo Hills are three major quartzite hills located in Botswana, Africa, and the mountains themselves are a site of great cultural and spiritual heritage, believed to have been inhabited by humans for the last 100,000 years. The hills contain hundreds of rock painting, with San and Hambakusha communities communities being the oldest living inhabitants of the land. According to the San, the three hills are a family, with the largest being the father, followed by the mother and the child a little ways away. There's also a secret fourth hill found even further away, who is said to be the husband's first wife, cast away in favor of a younger woman. Throughout the majority, if not all religions, we have had religious leaders. These leaders are designed to be the bridge between man and God, and often are given positions of authority within their communities. And this is no different from my own fictional religious leader, the Speaker, original name, I know. As members of our nomadic society grow older and theoretically wiser, they are expected to understand and learn more about their own culture. As their physical abilities wane, they memorize stories and legends and learn how to lead and guide the people in their band. And as a result, the oldest member of the band is the speaker, the one who has the most experience and knowledge, and has been blessed by the hunter god to live to a good old age in order to lead their people. Dichotomies when it comes to religion are pretty fun to write, particularly since a lot of how humans think tends to focus on contrasts and opposites, such as good and evil, night and day, and war and peace, like I mentioned in part two of my religions video. With this in mind, it makes sense that real world religions feature a lot of dichotomies, and you can definitely utilize dichotomies in your own writing of fictional religions. For example, two gods can represent, among other things, two warring philosophies and clash together like Athena and Ares. Or they can be two opposing concepts creating a virtuous dichotomy like life and death. Or they can be an apparent dichotomy that operates like two sides of the same coin. Dichotomies really help in creating gods that are foils to one another, both in character and in symbology. Bonus points if you write them to be otherwise emotionally connected to one another, as something like romantic partners, for example. In designing our nomads, I often use these assortments of bits and pieces strung through their hair, necks, arms, and tools as decoration. But there's actually a bit more to them other than their aesthetics. I call these strings ephemerals, and they consist of every little shiny thing, neatly shaped stones, shells, reeds, carved bones, and pretty feathers our nomads find while journeying across the wilderness. Because what are humans if not flightless crows? These ephemerals take sharp eyes and crafting know-how, not to mention hours of work to make in any substantial length. And so they grow to become reminders of the maker's experiences and are viewed as extensions of the makers themselves that hold emotional significance. And it is for that exact reason that these ephemerals are used as sacrificial items representing pieces of the maker, given to the hunter god as offerings in exchange for his goodwill. If you've seen past drawings of mine, you've probably seen me use a distinctive type of spear brandished by our nomad hunters. A typical spear with the upper staff adorned with sharpened bone spikes. Well, turns out that's a pretty unreal realistic design for a spear, go figure. Since its spikes would make it harder to properly spear game and would make it a lot heavier and awkwardly weighted, I'm thrilled to say it's officially been upgraded to a strictly symbolic spear, brandished by the speaker of the clan for ceremonial use only. I'll always remember you, spiky spear, not for your grace or elegance, but for the way you worked so perfectly as both a spear and a bludgeon in my mind. Did you know that survival in the Paleolithic was really tricky? I mean, obviously, but still. Humans were almost constantly in danger from outside threats, and they would have to act like it. Camps and shelters always had a few guards keeping watch for predators and other human groups. And when hunting, they had to rely on strategy, trickery, and war tactics to get by. Even something as small as striking rocks for tools or fire had to be done so only in somewhat safe environments, since even the sound would be dangerous and could draw who knows what near. On top of that, the night used to be a 
serious threat. That was when the nocturnal predators came out to play, and the dark allowed for anything to creep into your camp to steal away things like food and even small children. Recently, I've been talking a lot about stone tools, and one of the most common misconceptions you find when it comes to the public's view of prehistoric tool making is how, since we started off with stone tools at the very bottom of the tech tree, they were inherently easy to make and not very difficult to master. But on the extreme contrary, good stone tools took years of practice and skill to master, simply because you have to make them by hand and take into account the structure and grain of each individual stone you were carving the tool for, and every single strike had to be precise precisely angled and weighted so that the stone didn't chip wrong. So while they might not have been making Michelangelo level works of art, make no mistake, humans have been artisans since our species very birth and even before then. One of the most fun and impactful parts of world building is building up a local cuisine for your culture, because no matter what world you build, people have to eat. So a neat rule of thumb is to start from the literal ground up and look at four primary sources of food you're most likely to use. Farming, foraging, hunting, and livestock. Farming allows you to create a huge amount of the same foodstuff consistently, but you can only focus on a handful of produce to make in bulk, and preserving the leftovers is a hell of a thing. Foraging allows you to gather little bits of a huge variety of foodstuffs, not only only berries and fruits, but also bark, seeds, roots, leaves, and mushrooms. Just don't expect this method to be in any way reliable. Hunting requires a lot of manpower, strategy, and physical ability, but the rewards are often worth it, and the resources provided by any animal can extend far beyond just being used for food. This leads straight into livestock, where you get the benefits of hunting without the danger of being maimed. Just beware that the amount of work spent on keeping the livestock alive might mean it's not as sweet a deal as just robbing a beehive. Hi, I'm writing a comic set 48,000 years ago. And did you know that our main character Tala is severely lactose intolerant? That's because when she was born, no one had the random mutation near their lactase gene that allows modern humans today to consume and enjoy dairy. And in fact, that mutation didn't even develop until roughly five to 7,000 years ago, long after the invention of agriculture and the concept of livestock. So not only is Tala lactose intolerant, but so will her and all of her peers be for a good while right up until when wheat starts to get cultivated. But how did humans even develop the mutation in the first place? It's thanks to old-fashioned luck and random mutations, two of which were independently developed once in Eurasia and once in Africa, and both affected the lactase gene, while a third mutation again in Africa allowed for a completely different type of lactose tolerance, one that affected the microbacteria in the intestine and had absolutely nothing to do with the lactase gene. Neat, right?